Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Alexa with Quest. Today we have the next wave in workload automation. Um, our presenters are Rick Kane and Fred Linsink from Title. Uh, Rick is the vice president and Fred is the product specialist. Before they get started today, I do have a few housekeeping notes to go over with everyone. This session is going to be recorded and will be posted to the Quest content library. I'm also going to send everyone a link to download the recording and also the slide deck. Um, be out on the lookout for that here in the next couple of days. Also, we do encourage questions during this session. You can submit those in the questions drop-down located on your GoToWebinar box. You are on listen-only mode during the presentation, so you're going to be muted. Um, so any questions that you have, just please submit there. And again, uh, this is recorded, so um, I'll be sending that out in the next couple of days. So without further ado, I think that Rick's going to go ahead and kick it off for us. Thank you very much, Alexa. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rick Kane. I'm the Vice President of Sales here at Tidal. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Tidal, we're a longtime leader uh, in the enterprise workload automation space. Um, so, so what do we do? Um, you know, in a nutshell, we help you automate and orchestrate the complex relationships um, in your environment between your business processes, your applications, data, middleware, uh, data structures, et cetera. So um, your environments and orchestration like this is getting more and more complex by the minute. Um, and this complexity is exactly where a solution like ours provides the most value. So whatever your workflows are, wherever they're running, uh, Title Workload Automation can help you to orchestrate them. So we've been around 35 plus years as a leading automation platform. Um, we spent uh, many years as Title Software. Uh, we spent nine years at Cisco. So you may have heard of our product under the name of Cisco Workload Automation. Um, and since November of 2017, uh, we've been Title once again, uh, under the Dylan Kane Group here based in Chicago. Um, we have over 600 customers worldwide, so many of the largest organizations in the world use this to automate their data center. So customers like the New York Stock Exchange, Microsoft, HP, uh, Caterpillar, General Mills, uh, all run all their workload automation and job scheduling automation jobs through um, Title. So not only large customers, we also have many small you know, hedge fund type organizations that run just a handful of jobs, but jobs that are mission critical uh, and critically important to them. Um, and so they use a product like ours to ensure uh, you know, success with those jobs every time. Um, extremely scalable enterprise class. I mentioned customers like the New York Stock Exchange. They re run over a million jobs a day uh, through our product. Uh, we have other customers that have said that that month end processing, they run over a million and a half. Um, so, so very enterprise class, very large, can handle organizations of, of any size. Um, but that being said, um, we have a very low cost of entry, right? So um, flexible uh, licensing models that allow you to license specifically to what you're hoping to accomplish. So we have a lot of customers that come to us and, and buy our products specifically for a JD Edwards implementation, for example, or as they're rolling out Informatica and doing a, a data warehouse ETL BI um, project, right? They, they buy us for something like that and then expand over time to their organization. So um, there is a low cost for entry. Uh, based on your environment size and what you're looking to accomplish. Um, the real key to a product like this is cost containment, operational efficiency. You know, with, as with any automation product, you know, it's really about making smarter use of fewer resources, right? So you're always being asked to do more with less. That is exactly where this product fits in in your environment. Um, we do have pre-built, out-of-the-box, ready-to-go integrations with many, uh, of, and we'll talk about this, of the, the key applications, so ERPs, um, data warehouse, ETL, BI, et cetera, um, and especially within the Oracle family. We have a very tight relationship with Oracle. I'll talk about that a little bit coming forward. Um, but pre-built API level integrations makes your life very, very easy. Um, and this product is easy. I mean, if you talk to folks that use it, you talk to when Gartner used to do uh, analysis of this space, what they would always say about Title is it's the easiest product to use, the e easiest product to install. So there's no scripting language required. There's nothing you have to learn. Um, the learning curve is very low because once you learn how to create one type of job, um, everything's the same, right? So um, whether it be, uh, you know, variables, events, actions, dependencies, calendars, all those things that we'll talk about that are critical to job scheduling and workload automation, all of this are done with no scripting required on our end. Uh, if you look to the blue box there, I mean, really the key here is about centrally scheduling, automating, and managing your cross-application processes, right? So regardless of 
um, the, the operating systems, the underlying systems, the databases, the various applications that are involved with a business process. We're going to allow you to schedule them, automate them, and manage them all from one location. We align our processes with your global business calendar. So we come out of the box with 60 calendars. You can create all your own extremely easy. You can customize them, et cetera, to meet your own business needs. But more and more of our customers are doing scheduling based on events. And I'll talk about our event capabilities, um, but being able to schedule based on things that go, are going on in your environment. The business drivers, um, you know, arrival of files, changes in data, um, different things that are going on. So what we're essentially doing is ensuring that all your processes are executed in a timely manner and in a consistent manner the same way every time. In addition, we've got automated error recovery, operation security, uh, compliance, you know, we, we include management of your outage windows and audit logs, very, very detailed, and we'll go into a little more detail on that as well. So we provide you a, you know, a central point of command and control, single integrated view into all your workloads, all your business processes from one spot. Uh, we allow you, as I mentioned before, to go across platforms, right? So regardless of where you're running it, whether it's on-prem, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's, um, you know, an application like JD Edwards or something that's homegrown, um, we'll across all that with a business process, allow you to manage it, automate it, monitor it, et cetera, regardless. Um, speaking of cloud, obviously we've been around 35 years. Most of our customers you know, originally put this product on-prem and managed it in their own data center. We do have a lot of customers now that are going to the cloud, so in varying degrees, right? Maybe they're moving everything to AWS, or maybe they're just doing a little bit with an AWS, some in Azure, some in the Oracle cloud. It doesn't matter to us. We're going to be there to support you across all of those infrastructures. Whatever you choose to do, um, our product is going to work with you in those environments. Um, and lastly, on this slide, you know, we help accelerate the time to market. So not just in your move to the cloud, but in anything that you're doing in your environment. So any, you know, you're bringing in a new application or a new, um, you know, new module within your ERP, things like that. We not only with our API level integrations allow you to orchestrate and automate that quickly and easily, but more importantly, we allow you to tie it to everything else in the environment quickly and easily. So it's a very, very powerful thing. So let's talk about, let me just give you an example of what we do, right? So if you look at this um, example here, all these different boxes, this is an example of a business process that we might automate, right? Now there's thousands, probably millions, of different business processes, you know, everything from processing a claim to clearing a trade to, um, you know, month end, um, you know, any of your month end processing that you might do on a regular basis. In this case, we're looking at um, creating reports for your executives, right? C level um, type executive report. So it seems simple, but there's a lot of moving parts within this, right? So, um, you know, data has to come from somewhere, right? So it's coming from file transfers, it's coming from your business partner systems, it's being loaded into various ERPs or CRM tools. Um, once that data is in those tools, it's being processed. Um, and then there's being data being pulled out of that from an ETL tool, something like an Informatica that will do a cleanse, validate, and load the data into a data warehouse. Um, and then when all, once all the data is in the data warehouse, your BI tool might query that data warehouse, run the various reports and distribute them to your end users. So most of you probably can manage each one of these boxes, right? There are tools that you own that allow you to manage your FTPs, and you probably use a native scheduler around PeopleSoft or Oracle eBusiness, or the scheduler that comes with Informatica or with Cognos. All your databases have a various scheduler, et cetera. The problem with that is not only are there many silos where things could go wrong and a lot of different things to manage, um, but there's no one common view, right? You can go into multiple points and view data as it relates to that specific application, but you can't look across the business process, right? So there's lack of visibility, there's lack of control, there's no integration between these various tools. So, you know, the file transfer might be there and JD Edwards might pick it up, but it might not process it before the ETL tool does their data pull, right? Or the data might not be loaded properly from that ETL into the data warehouse before the BI tool runs the report, right? In that case, that data in that report is gonna be incorrect, right? The information you're sending to your C-level executives, not valid, right? So, and heaven forbid, a problem occurs somewhere throughout this entire business process, how do you go back and troubleshoot it? It becomes very, very difficult. So what we do with Title is we essentially sit over the top of all of it. So not only can we automate every one of these boxes, right? We can automate the file transfers, we can automate, everything that goes on within your JD Edwards, PeopleSoft, Oracle business. We can automate the data cleanse and validation, et cetera, all the way across the board, but we can also tie it all together. 
right? So the JD Edwards jobs do not kick off until all the files have arrived and downloaded complete. The ETL job does not kick off until JD Edwards has done all the processing it needs and all the way along the line. So we have full visibility of this for you. Um, you can monitor, you can drill down at any point on a workflow as it executes um, and, and very, very detailed reporting and tracking of all of this data uh, as it runs. So essentially giving you a central point of control visibility um, for every business process that you might run within your environment. We do all this with no scripting, as I mentioned before. So Fred will show our user face. It's very feature rich, drag and drop, extremely easy to use. Um, I mentioned calendars, right? So in the, historically, um, job schedulers or workload automation products were time and date based. Um, so as I mentioned, we do come out of the box with 60 calendars. You can create all your own very, very easily. So it's very easy to customize it to your exact company's needs. But we find more and more companies are moving towards an event-based scheduling. So what that means is, you know, I want to run business processes based on things happening in my environment. When this certain file arrives with this name, I want to pick it up and I want to run these processes against it. When a table changes in, or a row changes in this database, I want to pick that data up and process it in this way, right? When a predecessor job ends with a specific output or a specific error code, here's what I want you to do. Here's the business process that needs to kick, to kick off. And there's a lot more, right? I mean, we can monitor the systems on the servers that we're on. So things like, you know, at month end processing, I don't want to kick off a set of jobs because CPU on the server is at 90%. Instead, I want to reach out to vCenter or maybe to Amazon, to AWS, to EC2, and I want to spin up new machines that I'm going to move the data over to and process it on those machines, you know, specifically at month end, and then bring those machines back down, et cetera. We are all about managing the optimal business outcomes for your organization, and that's what you can do here. Cross-platform, multi-system automation, so any major flavor of Windows, Unix, Linux, uh, i-series, mainframe, you name it, whatever you're running on, we're going to be there to support you. Um, as you can imagine, running some of the largest data centers in the world, um, SLAs are critical, so we have 24 by 7 uh, reliability. There is, it's highly available, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, Role-based security built into the product, high volume processing, so customers running a million plus transactions on it, um, very, very uh, robust. Um, in addition to monitoring all the systems and being able to automate on all the different systems that I mentioned, we also have capabilities with all your major databases, so out-of-the-box adapters with Oracle, with SQL. We have a JDBC adapter that has a drop-down for 40 other database types, so Natiza, your various data warehouses, MySQL, things like that can be found there. Um, and a variety of different applications that you'll see here. We'll talk specifically about JD Edwards, uh, Oracle eBusiness, and PeopleSoft in this conversation. Uh, but there's a number of others that you can see here. And then there's more generic things like web services. So we can schedule and automate any web service, SOAP or REST-based web service application, right? So the vast majority of applications that are new that are coming out are web service enabled. It's very quick and easy for us to schedule those and allow you to work with those as well. We have FTP and secure FTP built into our products. We have a lot of very large financial uh, institutions that have required this for years. Um, so essentially, we can not only manage all your FTPs as part of a larger business process, but we also have uh, agents that are all FTP clients. So we can do file monitoring, things like that on all the servers that we reside on. We have built-in monitoring, built-in logging, alerting, remediation, recovery, archiving, reporting, you name it. So that'll go into all that, talk about that. All of that comes standard with the base product, right? So it's, you're not buying modules, right? This is all of these things come with the product. Um, we have role-based security that's built into the product, so you integrate with Active Directory or LDAP, um, and very, very detailed audit reporting. So we keep track of everything that happens in the scheduler. Every job that's run, you know, the execution time, you can compare it to, you know, last year, last month, whatever you want to do, last, you know, whatever. Um, you know, if a change was made to a job, you know, who made it, what was the change, when did they make it? Uh, what computer were they working on when they did it? You know, very, very detailed information, which a lot of companies use it for SOX and other type of compliance reporting. So real quick, I just wanted to give you an overview of, of the architecture before Fred goes into the product so you know what we're looking at. Um, if you look in the green box, that master, primary master, is title, right? That is our application that runs in your environment. It is, It can run on Windows, on Unix, on Linux, your choice. Um, that's the brains of the operation. That's what you interact with in order to create jobs, um, edit jobs, view jobs, um, rerun jobs, et cetera. 
um, that master then will also reach out to all the targets where you want to run work, where you want to automate all the different applications, servers, databases, et cetera. That master could be a standalone master or it could be fault tolerance, as I had mentioned. So there's a fault monitor you see there that can come with our fault tolerant configuration that will monitor constantly your primary master and back, you know, fail it over to a backup if you have any issues. There's a backend database that can be either SQL or Oracle, completely up to you. Um, and users interact with it via a, a number of different ways, right? So there's a client manager, uh, which is essentially a web server that we provide that um, provides a variety of different interaction points. So one of them being a web browser, that's the most common. Um, that's what Fred's going to show today. Um, you know, fully functioning web browser for anything and everything that you can need to do within the product. We also provide an iPhone application that you'll see there with the mobile app. Um, that's a little bit more of an operational tool, but it's wonderful. Customers love it for doing things like, you know, I, I get a, a message that there's an error uh, with one of my jobs at 7 o'clock at night while I'm sitting at dinner, right? I can simply pull up my phone, view the error, look at the output, see what the problem is, and click a button to rerun the job right from my phone, things along those lines. Uh, we also have uh, web services and command line interface in through that client manager. And lastly, as you can see in the right middle, um, we have a Java client, which is essentially a desktop client, which some of our customers use, um, you know, maybe for the command center, right? They have some people that use that. It's a little bit faster, um, and so they use that client. Um, from there, then, the master reaches out. It runs work. It can do it on various agents and of any OS, as I had mentioned before. Um, and you can also do it on those platforms at the operating system level, agentless. So if you don't want to put an agent on a server or you're, you, know, you can't for whatever reason, you're not allowed to, um, we can schedule via SSH, via WMI, other options as well there. Um, if you do have an agent on, there are some additional capabilities that you get, such as um, being able to monitor file systems, have an FTP client, monitor the servers that you're on, et cetera, but that's completely up to you. Then if you scroll up the adapter stack, we've got adapters for public and private clouds. So as I mentioned, we can connect to vCenter. Um, as part of a business process, spin up and down machines, add CPU, memory, those kind of things. We can do the same thing within Amazon with EC2 and S3, um, and we have capability for Azure and, and for Oracle Cloud coming very shortly as well. Uh, we'll announce them actually at Oracle Open World coming up here in a few weeks. Um, big data adapters at the top, you'll see our various database and BI uh, type adapters. And then what we're really going to focus for our demo today is more on that data center application, ERP space, specifically on people's software Oracle business and J.D. Edwards. So as I said, we have a very tight relationship with Oracle. Um, we've been spending a lot of time with their developers. We're building a significant number of new adapters around Oracle Cloud and Fusion right now. But for many, many years, we've had very, very strong adapters in the J.D. Edwards, Oracle business and people's soft space. We, you know, we support all Oracle databases, including Rack, uh, Oracle SOAP and REST web services, JMS, et cetera. Um, as I said, you know, you'll see us at Oracle Open World. We'll make some big announcements there as it relates to Oracle. And, and to give you an idea of the strength of this partnership, um, we are having our local Northern California user group meeting on Monday coming up, and it's being actually hosted by Oracle at their facility. So very, very tight working relationship with them uh, at this point. So one, two more slides before I turn it over to Fred for the live demo. And I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what we hear often from customers that use various native ERP schedulers. So whether it's the, you know, the scheduler that comes with JD Edwards or Oracle Business or some of the more basic schedulers that are on the market. Um, they express difficulty with a lot of, of the items that you'll see there on the left, right? They, have, they can't do complex calendaring. Um, they can't do dependencies specifically, and most importantly, dependencies on things that happen outside of their applications, right? So if there's other applications or data sources or things like that involved. Um, it's very difficult to monitor an end-to-end -end process of a job. Um, you know, alerting and, and various flexibilities in alerting to allow you to alert in different ways based on the types of events or, um, you know, the, the, the amount of concern over the error possibly. Uh, handling SLAs, handling output, um, doing root cause analysis. And this is one that we hear a lot, right? I mean, everything runs great until we have a problem and then we can't figure out it takes us forever, right? We have to bring a whole group of people together to try to troubleshoot the problem. You know, we don't, because we don't have a single point of, of you know, view. Fault tolerance, being able to schedule in multiple versions of the application, if you might be running multiple versions at the same time, things like that. All of these things are addressed by our product. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of them, but these benefits are provided to you regardless of which ERP we're discussing here, um, you know, providing you real-time visibility and insight, making it easier to manage and more resilient, um, et cetera. All these things are going to be done with our product, 
and Fred will show those. I think you'll see some of those coming through the demo. Last slide for me, um, and I don't really want to go into too much detail on this other than to let you know that we have slides like this for every single adapter that we have in our environment, right? This one's specific to JD Edwards. I don't know how many people here are running JD Edwards, but you know, there are things specific to that application that we do above and beyond everybody else, right? Uh, and some of these are simple. This certainly isn't a comprehensive list, but I wanted to give you an idea. Um, you know, being able to override data selections and processing options, or being able to distribute PDFs via email automatically on a successful job completion, different things like that. You know, we can do this for every different uh, adapter type that we have, right? So what I would ask um, is that after you see the demo, if you think this is something of interest and could be of value to your organization, um, maybe we schedule some time with you to walk through, you know, the different applications and systems that are in play in your environment, and we can prepare something like this that's specific to you, right? Based on whether you're running, you know, Oracle business with, you know, I don't know, some ETL and a different uh, BI tool, things like that. You know, what, what can, where can we provide value and what's the additional value that we can provide over what you're doing today? And that is uh, something that we'd love to do with, with all of you there and provide this sort of detail uh, specific to your environment. Uh, last thing, so I, I mentioned, you know, we are part of Dylan King Group, which is based here in Chicago, which is where I'm located. Um, you know, we've been here since November of 2007. Um, Dylan Kane has put a significant, more than doubling the size of the development staff that was on this product previously. Uh, our management teams in Chicago, we've got development teams that are based in Chicago, Houston, Minsk, Belarus, and India, um, as well as a support team that's based here in Chicago, spread throughout the U.S., 24 by 7 support, et cetera. Um, so, you know, very, very excited. Dylan Kane is doing some wonderful things with this technology. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of that. So with that, I will turn this over to Fred Lensink, who will drive dive deeper into the product and uh, show us a demo. Fred, I am passing you the ball right now. And let's see if I can pick this up. We should be able to see workload automation in action. So what we're going to do is head right into the GUI. As you can see, this is a web client. And that's going to be typically Internet Explorer, Firefox. Uh, you can see where I logged in as a particular user here. And depending upon how I was administered, you know, I might be part of the operations team. I might be part of the job definers. I might be part of the administration. Uh, depending upon, you know, how you're administered, you may or may not see all these various uh, menus and submenus. Right now, we're looking at job activity. And we're looking at an example of a, a business view, a graphical business view. Uh, that little icon right there, that clipboard, is representative of a group. And in that group, I have three other groups. You can kind of see I have a predecessor group, group 100, with an example PeopleSoft job. I have 200 group that has released backward job from J.D. Edwards in it. And then I have a successor group, group 300, that has an example Oracle EBS job in it. And what happens when these jobs run? Uh, typically, they're going to go into the schedule as a result of a calendar. There'll be maybe some dependencies to be satisfied. And at some point, the job will no longer be waiting on dependencies. It'll be satisfied. You can see the grandfather group here uh, going active. And then this group 100 going active and the PeopleSoft job launching. If that job completes normally, the group completes normally, we satisfy a dependency, and then we allow the next group to run, in this case, the J.D. Edwards job in group 200 that's going to release a back order. When that job completes, uh, after going active, same thing. We're going to satisfy a dependency. The job uh, group 300 has on job group 200, and that will allow my Oracle uh, EBS job example to run. So how did we get there? Right now, uh, we're, we're in job activity. We're part of the operations team, and the operations menu not only includes job activity, but a few others that we'll be highlighting today, event activity, uh, alerts, et cetera. The definition menus, again, depending upon who you are. Uh, you may or may not see all of these, but these are all the major components of, of any scheduler, uh, jobs, calendars, uh, actions, and events. We have a, an event action architecture that we'll be exploring today. Uh, heavy use of variables is uh, easy to do with this product. We have a nice hierarchy there. Uh, we also have a wonderful 
a hierarchy of cues that we can uh, utilize. In terms of administration, let's imagine that that's been done. We've got our users that are assigned uh, you know, role-based uh, uh, profiles that are going to help determine what menus they see, uh, what they can control, what they can edit, what they can view. Uh, in this case, we need to be able to make that end-to-end -end business uh, process run. In order to do that, uh, we'll, we'll have had to create certain connections. In this case, you can see where I have a multitude of connections, uh, but I'm highlighting the fact that, yes, indeed, we have a working J.D. Edwards adapter. And uh, if we get time, we may even be looking at uh, Oracle apps and PeopleSoft jobs as well. So we're going to leave connections behind. And now you can see that we're on the left-hand side. You can see we're under definition. So now we're a job definer, and we're looking at how jobs are organized. We've already kind of seen this, you know, once, the idea that I can have a group, and then in that group, I can have another group. In that group, I can have other groups. So I can have nesting of groups, and then I can have uh, inheritance of key values that, that go uh, from generation to generation, such as calendars or agents, time windows as well, time zones as well. So what we're going to do is concentrate specifically on uh, the fact that we have the ability to define jobs, set them up into groups and subgroups, and set up dependencies between those uh, jobs and groups. In particular, we're going to take a look at this pre-existing Oracle ERP group. Within it, it has job 100, and it has for job group 100 as the predecessor, job group 300 as the successor, and we're going to put in a, that job group 200 into that a business flow. So here I am in the, the job group release back orders, and I'm going to make the J.D. Edwards job. So notice all the different types of jobs that we have here. What we're going to find out is a certain a sense of commonality, ease of use, uh, an easy learning curve. And why is that? Well, that's because all these tabs that you see going from right to left up to scheduling are going to remain the same regardless of the type of job, whether it's an FTP job, Linux, Unix, Windows, a JDE, Oracle eBusiness, PeopleSoft will all be concentrated on this leftmost tab, and this will be specialized for that whatever particular application of this particular job type is. So you can kind of see that right now we're in a J.D. Edwards job definition. Images, well, we want to see an end-to-end -end graphical business view. We already talked about the fact, for example, that a job group had that, uh, that clipboard icon. But if I wanted to bring in my own images, I can load those up and then use those and select them from this tab here. The notes tab and both the notes tab and the runbook tab are, are capable of having either clear text or a URL uh, displayed. So that URL can be a, a diagram, a directory, uh, a web page, an application sign on. For the notes page, we're going to be using clear text here. Uh, for the runbook, I actually went out and got a link to a particular page uh, of the Oracle Help that has to do with. Uh, releasing back orders. So to release back orders within J.D. Edwards, uh, that can be done a number of different ways. It can be done interactively, online, um, and it can also be done via batch scheduling. This is the UBE for that, and there's actually a number of different versions of that where we're going to be using that today to release back orders. So you can see how handy it is to be able to go out and load that URL. That was actually a request from uh, General Mills many years ago. Hey, we already have information. Uh, we just want to, we don't want to have to re-enter it into your tool. We just want to be able to link to it and point to it. So the next uh, tab up is the options tab. These are set as defaults, you know, by the administrator in advance. And then I can come in here and override on a per job basis. I can say, you know, I don't want to append the, uh, the output for this job every time I rerun it, I want to overwrite it or I, I want to discard it. I need more than seven days of history retention for this particular job. I don't want uh, these, the operator to be able to enter this as a ad hoc job, or I don't want the operator to ever be able to rerun the job. Or maybe I would like a human to release a job, you know, regardless of the fact that I've satisfied all the other dependencies. And there's a couple other ones here. Uh, these three 
uh, relate to the fact that we can sync up with an outage window on any of our connections. Uh, that was an improvement that we uh, uh, worked in collaboration with Caterpillar on for their SAP environment. They had a scheduled maintenance window for a certain time. We can sync up to that. And more importantly, on a, on a per job basis, we can tell the job what to do in the event that it sees an outage window. I have a 90 minute job starting at 1 p.m. I have an outage at 2 p.m. Uh, the job comes online and says, oh, I want to collide with an outage window. What do I do? You can previously have instructed it to run anyway or skip or defer, uh, et cetera. Finally, the job priority, uh, that's an indication of our queuing capabilities. I want to have jobs within queues, queues within queues uh, in order to prioritize jobs uh, as they head out for execution. Another important part of the schedule is our event action architecture. Uh, we have many different types of events, but in this particular case, we're defining a job. So we want to focus in on just job events. What do I do in the event that a job completes? What do I do if a job completes abnormally, uh, completes normally, runs longer than uh, maximum, shorter than minimum? So these were events that I pre-configured for our selection. The one we're going to concentrate on today is for uh, when the J.D. Edwards job completes. Uh, that's going to be my event. I want to send, uh, send an email. And so we're able to then select, depending on what my event trigger is, and this is there's a long list of different types of job events, many of them related to SOAs, what is the action that I'm going to take? That's my reason for calling it the event action architecture. Every event can uh, trigger multiple actions. In this case, uh, we're just going to send a status email, and we're also, and we're also going to send an alert. And in both cases, uh, we're going to be able to use variables uh, that are going to get dynamically resolved at the point at which these emails and alerts occur. So you can see these angle bracketed values. Uh, they came from uh, the variable button when this was created. Those variables can be used in the message body. They can be used in the subject. They can even be used in the recipient, although not shown here. So we have a literal recipient here, but we could have a, a variableized group, uh, et cetera. Same for uh, the alert. You'll see we make heavy use of variables when we want to do notifications. So we not only have emails, we have alerts, we have the ability to do logging with this variableized uh, values, the ability to call web services, send SMP traps as well. Again, one event for many possible different notifications all at the same time. In this case, we're not going to be sending any emails uh, through this particular job event. We're going to be using a different type of event to do that. But you'll notice that I have those pre-made for uh, the PDF, uh, the logs, uh, the CSV, the, the output of the JD Edwards job. So now we have our, our event configured for this job. Uh, this is on a per job basis, but I can also have had uh, an administrator set up events that apply to all jobs. What is my standard operating procedure you know, for any job that completes abnormally? In this case, we don't have any of those. Dependencies. Now, we've seen job dependencies thus far. We've had job dependencies at the group level between group 100, 200, and 300. Uh, that's what we're looking at here. These dependencies can go from one job group to another job group, from a job group to a job, from a job to a job group, uh, and even from one job in one group to another job in another group, or from one master to another master. And it's all based on status. What are we doing? We're setting up that predecessor successor relationship. Don't run job B unless job A completes normally. Additionally, we also have what are known as file dependencies, and you can have a number of different dependencies, starting with the calendar, right? You have a date dependency, you can have a time window dependency, you can have predecessor successor dependencies, you can also have file dependencies. Don't run this job unless a certain file exists or does not exist. You know, has changed in 24 hours or been stable for 20 minutes. And because of the variable hierarchy that we have, we can typically match up to whatever naming convention you might have for those files. You know, for example, an embedded date separated by underscores that's, you know, hours and minutes, and et cetera. In addition to uh, the file dependencies, we also have what are known as variable dependencies. Uh, these are handy for controlling subsets of jobs. It's another way to allow or deny a group of jobs uh, from operating. And the variable 
will be at a certain value. Uh, and if it equals or does not equal meet that dependency or not meet that dependency, these variables can be manipulated in many ways from other jobs, from the web services that are inbound, from the command line interface, uh, et cetera. Moving on to the run tab, this is where we picked our JD Edwards adapter and we set up the default runtime user. This is not necessarily the user we connected with, but this is the user uh, that's provided by default. Depending upon the job definer, he may or may not be able to change who this job is going to run as. Uh, a typical example of that in a Linux environment might be you don't want someone to be able to run a job as root. Similar uh, approach patterns uh, are available for all of our, our targets. How am I going to track the job? Am I just going to use the exit code? Do I want to scan the output for a literal? I can actually make a job that's, that's uh, completing normally. I can say, hey, you know what, that's abnormal if I see uh, the word warning in the output, similar to a grep. And then you saw some of my events earlier, a shorter than minimum, longer than maximum. This is where a job definer can plug in uh, the values to trigger those events. We're taking a look at the schedule tab now. Notice the calendar section, the time window section, the repetition section. We're actually inheriting this, but I, I unplugged the, uh, the inheritance box there so you can see these calendars. There's some that come out of the box, over 60 you know, industrial strength calendars that have been in use in decades in some of the largest data centers in the world. And you can mix and match these to make new ones, uh, user-defined ones. You can create those from scratch. Or you can take an existing, you know, workdays calendar or holiday calendar that came out of the box and refine that to reflect your own holiday calendar, for example. In addition to uh, the calendar itself, you know, notice uh, uh, or notice that I can forecast that with this yellow forecast button. I can do that in text here. I can also do that graphically if I were over uh, in the calendar uh, menu. Notice now I put the inherited checkbacks back on. I can inherit the calendar. I can inherit uh, a time zone, if you will. I can also inherit a time window. Uh, and so these are all changeable on a per job basis. And then finally, the repetition cycle. Imagine, if you will, I want to be able to run a job uh, eight times every 15 minutes between the hours of 10 and noon on the central time zone on a daily calendar. We can answer all those questions here. Finally, we're to the JD Edwards job definition. Once again, this is going to be specialized uh, depending upon what type of job definition I'm creating. It too is browser based, or excuse me, tab based. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to browse for our release backloader UBE. We find out that there's uh, a number of standard versions of that, but the one that we want to, to work on today is backloader release final. So we'll select that particular one and we'll load that into uh, this job definition. And once we've done that, we'll be able to then move on uh, to the other options uh, that we have that are built into R4218, either by virtue of values in that job definition or by virtue of values, uh, for example, in our uh, connection screen. So when we made the connection for JD Edwards, uh, it was pointing at a particular batch server. Uh, and it had, we had selected QBatch as the default which a job definer could come in here and say, no, for this particular job definition, I want to use something other than the default that you defined at the connection, and I could pick an alternative uh, uh, queue. In terms of output, notice that I have selected for this job, uh, in addition to creating a PDF, I want to create a CSV. I want to create a, a JD Edwards log, a, D, a JD Edwards debug log, and I want to place them on the master so that I can use uh, that output as attachments in emails. And then other familiar uh, checkboxes if you were a JD Edwards person, and it would be the same again if it was PeopleSoft or Oracle, you'd find familiarity and hey, certain checkboxes I want to print immediately or I want to select a particular printer, uh, et cetera. In terms of data selection, very powerful feature, a reoccurring theme in any job, the ability to dynamically override values. So R42118 is, is configured to run uh, release back orders when quantities against quantities that are not equal to zero. Uh, I'm going to actually override that value. I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to write it against, uh, run that against quantities that are greater than 20. Now, in this case, that's a literal value. 
that that could be a variable. And that variable could be coming from uh, one of the, the menus that you see here, where I made it you know, available as a public variable. This might be a static value when I enter this in. Uh, it might be private to a particular group like dev. I have dev, test, and QA. But remember that because this is a variable, uh, some other previous job could be dynamically changing it you know, each time you run uh, this job. And in fact, uh, that same capability exists for processing options. I think that one example uh, should suffice, but notice the ability to override values. Notice the ability to access the variables button. And then finally, uh, other options. Many of our, our jobs have this where we can change the polling uh, on a particular target. So now we've got our job in our, in our group. What we're going to do is move that 200 job up into the Oracle ERP, the father group, if you will. Now you can see my 100 group as a predecessor, 200 release back orders in the middle, and 300 as a successor, each one with their example job in. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to create a business view from this. So I've shown you a way to create the jobs within the spreadsheet type view, but there's another way to offer graphical uh, views. And that's within this palette. I could have dragged my PeopleSoft jobs in here. I could have dra dragged my groups into here. Uh, but I just kind of did a hybrid here where we did part of it in the spreadsheet format. Uh, now we're going to do the dependencies in uh, the graphical view. So I select my, my source, and then I'm going to point to my target and create a, a dependency. Don't run group 200 unless 100 completes normally. Same for 300. Don't run 300 unless 200 completes normally. Here we are. Again, we could have uh, done this in this display on the dependency tab. Uh, what we're doing is we're just saying that, yeah, uh, 200 has, has a dependency on 100, and 300 has a dependency on 200. So now what we're going to do is we're going to insert this job group into the schedule on an ad hoc basis. Remember, we did not check that one checkbox that uh, would prevent me from doing that. And as we insert it in, we're back to the beginning where we have our jobs running. First job takes off. Or the, uh, the dependencies are all met. First group takes off. Second group takes off. Third group takes off. What we're going to do is zero in on that one job we just made and, again, see the commonality of how to drill down into a job, uh, the same, you know, tab-based approach. The status panel, right? Here's the uh, uh, job Go back up here. That's the job uh, number within JD Edwards. And you can notice that uh, I have some values here, estimated actual uh, duration. You can kind of see that some of that is behind us here. So this is a subset of some of the columns that we have in our spreadsheet uh, in the background here. And if I were an operator, so I'm under job activity right now, I'm an operator, I could go and view the job definition if I wanted. Here I see the day in the life of the job. From bottom to top, waiting, launched, active, completed normally. Here I see the output of the job. And again, we had a, a, a decision earlier where we could just get, you know, the output of the job. We could get a summary, uh, et cetera. But this is giving us all the basic, basic information we need. Here's my job number. There's my program. There's the version I ran. And notice that the, uh, uh, the job number is embedded. Uh, the, the version and the program are all embedded in that PDF name. There is our environment, our queue, uh, our priority in JD Edwards, uh, et cetera. Here's where I saved uh, those outputs for later. I got them into this particular directory so that I could access them as attachments. Here's where I overrode that one value in our UVE, and that's uh, indicated by our asterisk. We didn't make any overrides here, so no after it's visible in the processing options. We didn't have any dependencies at the job level. Remember, our dependencies are from group to group. We take a look at resources. We can see what queues were in use. Uh, we can override the job here and rerun on a different agent or a different runtime user. We can check uh, our web page and the runbook for instructions. We can see any notes that might have been provided. We can see the history of the job, the JD Edwards job. Is going to be specialized. This would be the same for PeopleSoft, Oracle, Business, et cetera. 
Uh, this is where we can, as an operator, see how the job was defined. And this is also where I can actually go in, if I wanted to rerun this job and override it with a new value, uh, I could do that from here as well. And then finally, the Run Info tab, I can see on the uh, here that I have the information, some of the same information we saw on the output, I can see that one place where we overrode the job. Finally, if I take a look at the Logs tab, uh, this is in addition to what we saw on the Output tab, that's my J.D. Edwards log, and my J.D. Edwards debug log had we turned on uh, debugging. So that same approach pattern is going to be available for any job across the top, status, audit log, output, et cetera. Notice here, I'm going to go back to that job. Remember, we overrode that one value. I'm going to rerun that job. And once that job is complete, if we were to go back and look at that data selection tab on the Run Info tab, we would find out that this time the override was a value of 30. So now we're going to take a quick look at events. When the job completed, we were able to send that event, or trigger that event. It finished. And what we're looking at here is the job completed email. This is a little different. This is our event monitor for J.D. Edwards. We have a, a status that's active. This is how we created the monitor. This is independent of, of making the job definition. We can monitor J.D. Edwards live. We're looking at any uh, event that has to do with R2, uh, R42118 creating that PDF. We'll schedule this monitor to be looking all the time. And that's when we're going to email our PDF, our logs, and our CSV. Again, notice the use of variables. Events have their own sets of variables. The, the PDF name, the path, the base, the UBE, the version. I'll be using those values down here to point to my attachment. So this is my trigger history for today. And those are my actions that I took. And this is the alert that I created. That alert was from creating that event. Again, portions of, of the UBE, the base, the path. And finally, there's a, an email here that was from the event with various values, the IDs, the UBE, the version, the fact that the PDF is available. You can see that a little better there. And then notice other ones that included, uh, for example, the PDF. Zoom in on that a little. We did one that had quantity of 80. Uh, the log, which we can look at with Notepad. And the, the log that we can look at with, or the PDF and CSV. And with that, I think what we're going to do is uh, hand this back over to Rick. Excellent, Fred. Thank you very much. Um, I did have a few questions that came in. And anyone, if you do have questions, um, there is a questions tab. You can enter them now. Um, there's a few of them that I wanted to quickly uh, we could go through. And uh, but if any any others come up, just put them in there, and we'll try to get them answered here. We got a few extra minutes. Um, first question is. Uh, Fred, maybe you can take this. How do you automate and integrate with applications that I do not see on your adapter list? For example, something like ServiceNow. And do you want to take that, Rick? Do you want me to take that? Well, I mean, I, I guess I can, I can take it a little bit here. So um, let's see here. Hold on one second. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that there's – um, a number of ways, right? So, I mean, typically we can, you know, it, even if it's an application, we, we often get the question, um, you know, application X, I don't see it on your adapter list, how would you do it? Um, you know, and the answer is, you know, a lot of times now it's via web services. We would use an application like that. We can also do it from a command line. Um, so, specific to ServiceNow, which was in that question, uh, we have customers actively doing it with uh, the web service adapter right now. Now, we are in the process and are going to be building uh, an API level integration with ServiceNow, but right now we have big customers, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, others that do it using our web service adapter. But you know, if you don't use something like that, there is command line available and a number of other options. I don't know, Fred, if there's anything more you want to add to that. 
No, that's good. I mean, it's always okay. the same question. Where is my adapter when people see uh, our, our, our web GUI or our Java client? And the fact of the matter is, is that we're going to be able to automate just about anything. So the first way that we would check and see, you know, is there a command line of some sort? And there's two ways to do that. You can do that with an agent, right? You can have a Linux agent, a Windows agent installed on the server. The master talks to the agent. The agent talks to the command line. But alternatively, you don't necessarily need an agent because you could use uh, the SSH adapter. And that way, you could be doing it uh, agentlessly on Windows or Unix or Linux. There's also another adapter, the remote job adapter, that is made specifically for Windows and does it via MI, uh, WMI. But these days, over time, in addition to a command line interface, uh, people started moving towards web services. So then oftentimes there's a SOAP interface that you can uh, utilize in order to interface with an application. Uh, and then, uh, then REST came on the scene. So that's another way to do it, either by the command line, by SOAP web services, by REST web services, right? Or uh, in the case of ServiceNow, possibly by one of our future adapters, uh, such as those for Fusion, such as those uh, for ServiceNow. Um, there is a question about our relationship with Oracle. Um, I think I mentioned quite a bit of that early on, so I, you know, I don't need to go into too much more detail, but we do partner with them very, very tightly. Um, we've spent significant time in their development labs, and they have spent time with our developers. Um, we've you know, long had adapters uh, for all of their key ERPs, for their databases, et cetera. Um, our product can run you know, not only schedule on their database, but we can use Oracle as our back end. Um, as I mentioned, we're a, you know, an ISV partner. We have, we're going to be at Oracle Open World with a kiosk and some speaking sessions there, um, as well as, um, you know, I think I, I mentioned they uh, are going to be actually even hosting our, our Northern California user group coming up here next week. So a very, very tight relationship. I think there's a lot more to come on that soon. So um, yeah, I think we're going to be making some announcements at Oracle Open World about some of our new adapters around OCI and Fusion, et cetera. Um, that I'm not at liberty to really talk too much about here, but you know you'll be seeing those things soon. So um, very very strong relationship. Um, let's see another question about do a lot of customers migrate from other automated automation products? Um, that's common. I mean you know we can um, you know easily convert from you know cron and database schedulers and other things like that. We have uh, um, you know. Thing, you know, basically that it can allow you to, to convert from anything, right? Any other scheduler, um, you know, it's very, very common from the native um, ERP or application schedulers that you might be running uh, to convert. We have a process to do that, to convert all those jobs into title, um, you know, and, and give you one central point of control. But, you know, also other products that might be out there, um, you know, J.D. Edwards, ActiveBatch, things like that. It's very common for customers to convert off of those um, you know, to a more enterprise class scheduler such as ours, so not uncommon. Um, there's a question about, um, I knew your product when you were part of Cisco, you've got a long history, um, what's the roadmap and plan going forward? So that's a little bit more of a discussion probably than I can have here. Um, yes, we did, uh, you know, we, we were independent, you know, an independent company, Title Software, for a long time, um, spent nine and a half or eight and a half years, almost nine years um, with Cisco. Um, which I was there with them, and uh, been almost a year now with with the Dylan Kane Group. Um, we do have a pretty significant roadmap and plan going forward. As I mentioned, uh, some significant changes, um, additions, and, and increasing of our development team, our support team, our QA staff, et cetera. Um, and we'd be happy to share that with you. So uh, once again, if you're on here and you're interested in learning more, we'd be more than happy to engage with you to show you, uh, you know, one on one that roadmap. Um, and, and kind of walk you through some of the things that we have coming down the road. It's pretty exciting uh, for us. So um, with that, you know, I, I did kind of want to, as a call to action, you know, more than happy to do a roadmap and show you that plan. But what we'd really like to do with the folks on this phone, uh, on the on the webinar here, is, you know, if you think this is a value, if you think it might be something that could help your organization, um, we'd love to sit down with you and kind of do what, what we would call a free assessment, basically, right? Kind of walk through. Um, your environments, what you're doing currently, um, you know, the different applications and databases and systems and kind of business processes that you run and, you know, prepare something for you around how we can help, right? Sit down with, you know, 
uh, overview of the various adapters and various functionality and features and benefits that we can provide for you, um, prepare a customized demonstration um, that shows the product specific to your needs, um, and kind of go through that. Um, if you have additional information, you can go to our website, which is titleautomation.com. Um, you can find information about the company there, about the product. Um, there's specific uh, data sheets about each one of our adapters. So if you wanted to get more information about the Oracle business or PeopleSoft adapter, um, there's a link uh, within our enterprise integrations where you can go right to PeopleSoft and get information about that solution. So, um, and I did, you know, in there, uh, sales at titleautomation.com. Um, any questions that you might have, any additional information we can provide, or if you just want to set up uh, that free assessment or a follow-up demonstration, we'd be happy to work with you there to do that. Um, so at this point, that was all that I had. Alexa, um, I don't know, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, Rick and Fred and everyone over at Tidal, just a big thank you for presenting with us today. Um, and everyone also that was on the line, again, this session was recorded and will be posted to the Quest Content Library. I'm also going to be sending you a link to, uh, so that you can get that um, here in the next couple of days. So a big thank you to everybody. Um, and I hope to see everyone on the next Quest Online Learning Session. I hope you all have a great rest of your day.